In November 2020, the regiment's commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew White, was given the honour to tell the story of what the regiment did in 2020 to the Defence Reserves Association National Conference. 2020, a year of natural disasters the like of which had never been seen before on our continent. A year in which the Governor-General activated a provision of the Defence Act 1903 never used before. A year where the ADF was called and helped. The DRA conference was online. This presentation was prepared and sent from the New South Wales Victorian border where the regiment was deployed. It's an absolute pleasure to be here today, albeit via video, to share my experiences of being a reservist in 2020, a year like no other. Firstly, if I can add a disclaimer, all of the following presentation is based on my own views and don't necessarily represent those of the ADF. Secondly, I'll use interchangeably the terminology of reservist with part-time and also service category five, um, juxtaposed with CERCAT seven for full-time uh, and the regular army. I'll be focusing on three main topic areas today. They are Operation Bushfire Assist 1920, the change in Army Reserve parade patterns following the COVID-19 outbreak, and Operation COVID-19 Assist. I will close with some of my observations on service as a reservist throughout this year across all of these activities. I will note that I am biased in that I am the commanding officer of the 1st 15th Royal New South Wales Lancers and so I will be uh, heavily preferenced towards my experiences with that regiment. In November 2019, we were asked to conduct a call out exercise. This was an opportunity for us to see how well we could execute a call out for a limited number of volunteers if that was ever required. It proved quite um, fortuitous in that we were able to iron out several of the kinks and bugs associated with us doing a general call out, which would occur not that much longer. I'm sure everyone will remember the devastating bushfires that started in southeast Queensland and continued down through New South Wales and Victoria uh, from late 2019 and into 2020. This created an unprecedented catastrophic event for the East Coast and some other parts of Australia. And it was the Commonwealth who offered support via the ADF to help each of the states and territories as the lead agencies um, combat these devastating fires. For the 5th Brigade and for the Lancers uh, based at Holsworthy and Parramatta, we, we commenced the uh, launch of a response team in early January. This was prior to the call out, so this was a call for. The Lancers were able to generate a cavalry squadron mounted in PMV, uh, which left round about the 6th of January and was in the field for about 28 days or so. That element was attached to the 5th Engineer Regiment and operated largely in southern New South Wales, providing support uh, to the uh, RFS and New South Wales Police in bushfire response and later bushfire recovery. These reservists deployed with uh, literally days notice to move. And as mentioned, this first element were all called uh, for, not called out. I was very pleased at the timing and the response that we were able to generate. And being a mounted unit, uh, we operated three ways fit. So our vehicles were good to go. They were fully equipped. Our radios, all of our stores uh, were able to be done uh, at short notice. On the 4th of January, 2020, 
the Minister for Defence and the Governor-General signed off on a general call-out of the Australian Army Reserve. While the general call-out was put in place, the actual requirements within each state and within each uh, joint task group were a little bit different and quite nuanced. Originally, there was no requirement for First 15th, for example, to provide additional soldiers to what had already been committed in the call for. However, by the 8th and 9th of January, that position changed and the 1st 15th was tasked with raising a second emergency support force element, which is a, a squadron size group to conduct uh, general duties type activities. As with the first element that was done under call four, this second team was raised within a matter of days and launched with the remaining PMVs that the regiment had, plus some additional vehicles that we were able to get. While the first team was still attached to uh, the 5th Engineer Regiment uh, task group, the second uh, team worked under the 2nd 17th task group. So we had two groups, one in the far north of New South Wales, in, from basically Singleton up to Taree, and then one in the south in the sort of Bega, uh, Eden area. Not long after that, the regimental headquarters came in uh, and replaced the J5 cell. So uh, by early February, we had most of the regiment committed, with the exception of those who could not participate under the call out or the call for due to emergency services employment. This meant we had about 80% of the regiment on operations uh, by early February, which was an amazing achievement in itself. By the 27th of January, we'd largely moved, moved into a recovery mode. That involved lots of route clearance activities with chainsaw teams. While the first PMV squadron that 115 launched was largely based on B squadron out of Canberra, the second squadron or ESF that went in the field and operated from Singleton up to Taree was a conglomerate of the rest of the regiment. So that included the regimental bands and two troops of cavalry scouts. There's about 120 in that element. Of note was that it didn't matter what trade or corps each of these soldiers had, they were all able to contribute equally in the task we had. Largely they were doing route clearance, as mentioned, chainsaw work, but in the north in particular, we did kilometres and kilometres and kilometres of fencing, putting up burnt or damaged fencing uh, right across uh, all sorts of government areas based on request from local government uh, areas. By about the end of February then, things started to wind down and we were able to catch our breath and conducted our retrograde activities by early March. If I just come back to late February for a minute then, we'd already just started to hear about this word COVID. Uh, COVID-19 had, had uh, it may have been known by another name earlier on, but it had started to jump boundaries and so the, the world was starting to pay attention to this. There wasn't yet confirmation of its pandemic status, um, but we knew something big was happening. And I remember joking um, in the headquarters with the bushfire team that I wondered if we were gonna start switching soon from bushfires uh, to a COVID-19 response. First 15th uh, finished its time, as mentioned in early March on our bushfire assist and we went back to our regular parade patterns. However, that only lasted for about two weeks. And then as the impact of COVID-19 started to become clearer, we had to move quickly to an alternative parade pattern. So traditional reserve regiment, we would parade on a Tuesday night and a couple of weekends and maybe some um, longer periods throughout the year as well. We started to hear terms like social distancing a lot and we knew straight away that we were unable to come together the way that we'd traditionally done. And we had to start to innovate and think about new and better ways to connect, to still conduct our training, but to mitigate the risk of the spread of this terrible disease. 
there were some really uh, interesting thoughts and ways that the regiment was able to then conduct business. Unfortunately, during this time as well, the cadet unit based at Lancer Barracks and the uh, regimental museum run by our association were both shut down and unable to parade at all. However, for the regiment, we moved largely to a virtual way of parading. We established uh, through a number of different uh, video technologies, different courses, different ways of connecting all via online. Some of them were GovTeams, ADEL was another one where we could post content and there were other PME activities that we were able to do during well. this time as well. This indicated to us that you do, you do not need to always physically come together uh, as a squadron or a troop or a regiment to conduct your training. And you need a level of trust and oversight and preparedness to make this work, which I think we were able to achieve. However, there are always some tasks that can't be completed remotely, in particular things to do with, say, weapons, for example. During this time as well, uh, we started to set the conditions for some engagement with our uh, Five Eyes partners. And this culminated a little bit later where we were able to conduct a, um, like a video conference weekend with an element of the Royal Yeomanry based in London and some other Yeomanry units uh, from the British Army Royal Armoured Corps Reserve. This was a great example of the power of technology and how it can easily transcend boundaries. It also showed us um, what might be possible from a interoperability perspective with coalition partners. As we were just getting used to our new normal throughout March, uh, the commander gave me a call right at the end of March, it was the 30th of March, and asked if he could come and visit Lancer Barracks. Um, when the commander arrived, after having a look around at uh, the oldest continuously occupied barracks on mainland Australia, he turned and said, Andrew, do you think you can stand up a joint task unit? I think we're going to need another JTU to go into the field. Um, I was delighted to be asked, um, but also quite worried around what 115's ability would be to put an entire 115 Lancer joint task unit in the field. My fears were allayed quite quickly. We had an overwhelming response from the regiment and within about four days, we were able to generate all of the force elements that were required for our part of op COVID-19 assist. Uh, the Lancers were required to conduct uh, what was called New South Wales Ports Quarantine Compliance Management. And so while our sister regiment, or sister JTU rather, was dealing with hotel quarantine compliance management and airport arrivals, and contact tracing, New South Wales Police had identified a gap in regard to the ports, commercial ports of entry across the state. Uh, so we launched within a couple of days, providing quarantine compliance management support across the four major commercial ports in New South Wales, which were the Port of Eden, uh, Port Kembla, uh, Port Botany and Port of Newcastle. And those who know their geography, that's quite a large stretch of coastline. Each of those ports, we established a troop headquarters and element, if you like, to look after all of the commercial shipping that came in over that time. Uh, we definitely weren't the main effort during this time and I was very happy that that was the case while we got ourselves uh, shook out on the ground. All of the lances that tipped out uh, had largely um, committed for about 28 days. So we knew the commitment may be longer, may be shorter, but we were looking good for that first 28 days, which was the month of April. Uh, as things happened to be, the nice quiet uh, port QCM task that we'd hoped um, we'd had suddenly shifted very quickly with the arrival of the MV Ruby Princess into Port Kembla. Now this happened after she had already disembarked her crew in Sydney and she was sitting off the coast of Sydney um, with most of the government not quite sure what to do with her. 
At the time, she had over 500 crew still embarked, and she needed to remove uh, crew who were required to be repatriated by air, as well as deal with any of the COVID positives that were on board that vessel. This became a very uh, politically sensitive issue uh, and one that required a high degree of nuance uh, and care. I'm very pleased at the response that the young troop leader who was managing Port Kembla was able to do in support of the New South Wales Police and the health agencies as well to get, um, I think, close to several hundred crew members successfully repatriated or move to an appropriate health facility where they could be managed. Uh, the New South Wales Ports task uh, ended at the end of May. Uh, during that time, we had looked after 1,155 different vessels across those four ports that I mentioned. Just a note on the reserve endurance. So uh, as indicated, we'd done op bushfire assist the call out was a 28 day commitment. The call for was largely 28 days, but then um, in both cases, people could extend beyond that. And then we just completed another 28 days through the month of April uh, for the New South Wales Ports task. This then continued for another month, um, being May. By this stage, a lot of our reservists were um, getting quite tired and needed to go back to work. So we started to sub in, if you like, some different troops. So we had a troop from uh, the School of Military Engineering who were regular army uh, engineer trainee IETs. And we had a, a troop from RAF base Williamtown as well. So we moved slowly uh, into a joint a mixed CERCAT environment, uh, which was you know, some good learning for us as well. Uh, that task, as mentioned, finished at the end of May, uh, and we thought that would be it for the Lancers. So uh, we disestablished the JTU, and everyone went back to their day jobs. For myself, uh, I went back to a large bank, and I was working on aspects of the Royal Commission and some cultural and performance-based change required within the executive population. That lasted... Um, until the 6th of July. On the 6th of July, uh, Jock released a task order indicating that the uh, closure of the New South Wales border with Victoria was imminent and that this would take effect uh, on the 8th of July. Jock was tasking 500 ADF to move at best speed to the border in order to occupy positions in support of the police in border control checkpoints. I remember distinctly uh, at lunchtime on Monday the 6th of July, uh, the deputy commander and later the commander uh, touched base and said, what are you up to? Do you think you could be in Albury tomorrow? Um, and while I wasn't quite able to achieve uh, the 24 hours notice to move, within uh, probably about 48 hours, myself and the entire um, regimental headquarters supplemented from the squadrons was in or en route uh, to the border to conduct this task. This was a uh, ginormous task in terms of its scope and in terms of its operational reach. For those who are familiar with the border, it stretches from the Pacific Ocean at Eden all the way through to Baronga, which is just north of Mildura, not that far from the South Australian border and Renmark on the South Australian side. The border is about 1,400 kilometres, as mentioned, if you follow the road or, or the river for a large part of it. And, it. and it contains many different geographic zones as well. For anyone who's been in these parts in July, they'll know it gets exceptionally cold. Several of our checkpoints were in the police district of Monaro, which is the southern end of the Snowy Mountains. So about 40 minutes from Jindabyne, for example, we had a checkpoint at a location called Barry Way. At Barry Way and in that area, uh, in the days, days preceding our arrival, it had the largest snowfall in the last 10 years in that area. Um, hopefully you'll see some pictures on the slides 
um, of how deep the snow was. And these are the locations we were occupying. Uh, just to come back to the move in then, the uh, Lancers were able to generate the JTU headquarters at very short notice with a bit of augmentation. We did want a joint flavour in the headquarters, so we tried where possible to have our purse branch filled by Air Force, our logistics branch filled by Navy, and our ops branch filled by Army. That allowed us to help talk the language of all of the services that we were working with and also um, make sure that we were representative of the task and that rather the force elements that we had in the field. 500 ADF were generated. We organised the 500 into five uh, company or squadron size groups and each of these were overlaid across um, five different police districts, although there were there were splits over the different uh, police districts. What that ended looking like uh, after we'd had time to shake out, and by the way, from the time the troops arrived, um, I would think within about 48 to 72 hours, we had all 500 successfully on the border in 20 different checkpoints across uh, that very large area of operations that we spoke about. The force disposition that we had had largely in the Monaro and South Coast Police District, that's Eden and the Snowy Mountains area, we had our Navy subunit. In Riverina, we had our Army Reserve subunit, which was made up of reservists from the 5th and 8th Brigade, which was great to see the university regiments being able to provide soldiers. In the Aubrey area, where we had our largest checkpoints, we had a subunit from the Army Logistics Training Centre. Then uh, stretching further west along the Murray River, we had a subunit from the 8th, 9th Royal Australian Regiment. And then finally in the far west of the AO, we had a subunit from the Royal Australian Air Force. So you can see uh, the force that I had was very much joint, was mixed circuit, uh, all sorts of unique challenges in how the services all work and how we work together. And we're not the lead agency. We're in direct support of the New South Wales Police. And we're operating in a degraded health environment with the COVID-19 threat. So the things that are worrying me, uh, certainly at the start, where on earth we're going to sleep and how we're going to feed ourselves in all of these remote locations, given the temperature, how we're going to protect ourselves from COVID-19 how are we going to conduct our tasks to make sure that um, we support the communities that we're looking after? And the mantra that we used in the JTU was about being, showing empathy, um, being humble and being professional. And so I gave that to all of my subunit commanders. If nothing else, fall back on these three words. We have a lot of distressed Australians who are dealing with this pandemic in different ways. We are imposing controls on their movement, which they will not have necessarily had before. And we're trying to do it in a way that keeps ourselves and them safe uh, in this environment. The Lancers were set to deploy for 28 days. And that was, that was what we thought might be the end of the border shutdown. So that was from the 8th of July. Uh, it's now the 1st of November and I am sitting here in Aubrey uh, at one of our headquarters locations. So uh, again, didn't read the tea leaves very well. Um, after the Lancers had conducted all of the establishment of the Joint Task Unit in uh, July, we were able to hand over to the 1st 19th and then 41 Royal New South Wales Regiments to catch our breath through the month of August. Uh, however, it wasn't long uh, before we were back again in September, and we've been here uh, since early September. Uh, and as mentioned, it's uh, early November right now, uh, and we're hopeful to be back uh, off the line uh, sometime soon. Uh, if I can make a couple of observations from uh, the op COVID task. Um, all of the jobs that we got, uh, as was the case a lot of the time in bushfires and the New South Wales Ports QCM, it didn't really matter what service you were. It didn't really matter 
what um, SIRCAT you were, and it often didn't even matter what rank you were. The task that we had was an absolute leveller in all of these activities. Um, if I again come back to being humble, professional and empathetic, we were standing on checkpoints, supporting the police, conducting um, quarantine compliance checks, which originally were paper-based, and then we went to a, um, a, scanning, a scanning methodology after that. Each of the subunits were responsible for, through their service chiefs, for uh, generating their own, their own rotations. So we've had, um, across the different opcovids, I've had JSF pilots, I've had submariners, I've had clearance divers, I've had infantry soldiers, I've had cavalry troopers. Um, we've had a really wide eclectic bunch of trades and different people from different corners of the ADF who've all worked just as effectively as each other, but in their own unique ways. The other point I'd like to make is that only 28 days of all this operational tempo that we've had has been associated with the call out. All of the other activities have been done as a call for. So I, I talk about um, ask and they will come, or cometh the hour, cometh the reservist. We know that on a Tuesday night, uh, our parade attendance you know, could be anywhere from, from 50 to 70 per cent. However, for this task, we've been able to fill our quotas again and again and again um, because our soldiers want to be there, because they want to serve, because they want to be involved, because they feel committed to the task that's before them. And often they want to do that in their regimental or squadron or troop groupings as well. They want to get out, get into the task and do it with their mates. While I've been down here on the border, um, I've, I've come across two historical, historical events, I guess, that I just want to touch on. The first was in early July, the police commander who was working with me in the forward headquarters in Aubrey, he showed me a picture. It was a black and white picture. And it was of a New South Wales policeman sitting alongside a member of the Australian Army with the words 1919 Spanish flu delegate. Now delegate is one of the border towns and it's one of the checkpoints that we were occupying in July 2020 dealing with yet again another global pandemic and yet again we side by side with our partners working in an interagency setting. So I found that um, very interesting and I think we often forget our history um, but it was a an important reflection point that we've been here before into the exact locations in some cases dealing with something that's quite similar. The other uh, anecdote or historical anecdote I'd like to share is that when I got down here I learned of a New South Wales Lancer who had passed away in a border town called Corowa. Corowa is to the west of Aubrey uh, and it was the um, foundation of Federation I believe or the birth of Federation. I didn't know much about this soldier but I knew that he had fought in the Boer War. I knew he was a member of the regiment and I was keen to visit his grave and just pay my respects quietly. On finding out a little bit more about him, his story is, um, what's the word, thesaurus? Emblematic. Emblematic, that's it. On finding out a bit more about this soldier, whose name is Trooper Tom Morris, his story is emblematic of much of the service that we've had recently. He was a 19-year-old who came from Singleton, enlisted in the New South Wales Lancers. For those that know a little bit about the Lancer history, in uh, 1899 we went and trained in the UK, conducting cavalry training at Aldershot. On our way back, we stopped into Cape Town for a stopover and war just happened to be declared um, the Boer War. The Lancers telegraphed back to the Premier of New South Wales to see if they could participate uh, and largely got a, a positive response, I think, for those that were over 18 or 21. 
Trooper Tom Morris uh, was part of that contingent and served with the Lancers over the next year or so. On one of those engagements, he was on a reconnaissance patrol when they were engaged by the Boers. As they were falling back, he looked over his shoulder and he noted that uh, the, the last man behind him, a mate of his, had had his horse shot out from under him. Trooper Morris turned his horse around, went back and picked up his mate, doubled him up on his horse and was able to get him back to safety, all under a hail of bullets from the Boers. For this action, he was nominated for the Victoria Cross, becoming the first Australian to be nominated for this uh, award. Sadly, he was never uh, awarded the Victoria Cross and he ultimately left the Boer War with typhoid, returning to Australia. He then finished his service with the Lancers and joined the New South Wales Police at Corowa, where he served for the next 30 years or so, uh, rising to the rank of police sergeant uh, in the township of Corowa. He ultimately passed away there in 1955, where he's buried today. And I reflect on his service in both of the organisations and, and what the Lancers have done recently in partnership with the New South Wales Police. And I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to reflect more on his service uh, and pay my respects uh, when we'll be visiting his grave shortly. In closing, this has been a year like no other. The Lancers have been deployed for six months of this year so far, most of that with an 05 or 05 Lieutenant Colonel headquarters in the field. This year has demonstrated that it doesn't matter as much about which uniform you wear in the ADF or which specific trade you have. There was absolutely a job for everyone and there was a critical need from the states and territories for the ADF support in order to combat whether bushfires uh, or, or COVID-19. This year has demonstrated that our reservists remain passionate, committed, and keen to serve as much as they always have. This year has demonstrated that they're almost an untapped well of service there. If the need is there, they will come. Most of the reserve deployments have operated under extremely short notice to moves. Anywhere from 24 hours to seven days, we've been able to put subunit or subunit plus size reserve units uh, or groups in the field. And that's amazing in itself. If we think about the old strategic reserve model, we might have been working on a six month lead up for the reserve to come and occupy full time positions in, in a greater conflict perhaps occurring overseas. Finally, we've learnt that the reserves are capable of providing all of the required effects that have been asked of them in support of domestic operations in Australia. Thank you.